We are going to kick off um, with Dan Yeomanson. He is um, a paediatric um, oncologist um, for, and also for teenage, um, teenagers and young people um, up in Sheffield. He's got interest in palliative care um, and in fertility preservation. And he's, work, um, he's worked locally to develop services and also working with NHS England to develop service specifications um, around fertility preservation. He is going to talk to us about that, his, his specialist subject. And please make him feel welcome. Sorry, before I start, we've got, um, before Dan starts, we've got um, Lottie, who is our Twitter moderator today. Um, she is at Boccarelli, so please tweet any questions. But as it's an informal group, hopefully we can um, have some discussion at the end. Uh, thanks very much, and thanks for uh, coming to this paediatric oncology session. Given the um, delegate list and the con other concurrent talks, I wasn't sure if we'd all be sort of sat around a single sofa. So it's <laughs> nice to have a, a small group. Um, but, you know, I'm going to talk to you about fertility preservation. Um, and if you've got questions, feel free to uh, you know, ask them at the end. Um, fertility is um, essentially the ability to, to conceive and then have a baby. It affects males and females. Um, and it's instinctively really important to the parents of uh, people who needed, you know, young people newly diagnosed with cancer. And it's certainly really important to young adult cancer survivors. Now, helpfully, that sort of uh, importance is reflected in the investment in fertility technology, largely driven by IVF which means that it's a field that's rapidly moving on. There are more options available for teenagers and, and young people diagnosed now than there were even five or ten years ago. And I'm going to take you through a little bit of that journey. So as you've just heard, I'm a, a paediatric and TYA oncologist. I look after children from birth uh, until around 18, 18 years of age, and I'm also involved in the care of patients up to about the age of 25 through my work with the adult services. And within that age range, 0 to 25, 10 patients a day are diagnosed with cancer in the UK. And when I tell people I'm a paediatric oncologist, they always say, why the hell would you want to do that? It must be awful. Well, it's not. It's, it's actually, a lot of the time, a very rewarding and a lot of fun. And eight out of those ten patients who are diagnosed today will go on to be long-term survivors. That means what you can hear about from Erica later is becoming increasingly important. So we're increasingly focused on uh, quality of life, quality of survival. And in fact, lots of oncology trials in diseases that we are good at treating are increasingly focusing on reducing late effects of treatment rather than improving cure rates. And one of those important uh, long-term morbidities is infertility. And of those 10 patients diagnosed today with cancer, one will be rendered infertile by their treatment. Okay? And that's largely predictable. It's largely dependent on chemotherapy treatment, except in fairly rare situations where both ovaries or both testicles are removed surgically or, are or in the radiotherapy field. But it's largely based on chemotherapy which is dose-dependent and predictable. And that means we have the ability to identify those patients up front and prioritise them for access to fertility preservation. Sperm cryopreservation, or sperm banking, is the most straightforward and most widely available fertility preservation technique. And that is great if you're a post-pubertal male cancer patient. You can go to the sperm bank, Make, give a sample. That, tissue, that, that, that semen can be stored for you know, 50 years. It still works. It can be defrosted and used at any point in the future. But that can be a difficult subject to introduce. A new patient just diagnosed with cancer, 13-year-old boy, not necessarily going to want to talk about masturbation in front of his parents. And you've got to think about how you're going to ask his parents to leave the room while you have that conversation. There's also practical difficulties. So even if that patient is uh, able to masturbate, they may not feel well enough to do so. They may not be able to under the time pressure that they're facing, and they may not uh, be able to in the very clinical environment they're often asked to do so. Even if they're able to produce a sample, there may not be any sperm in it. And that may be because of their pubertal stage, or it may be because uh, they've been rendered azoospermic by their disease. So many patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma at diagnosis are azoospermic, even if they weren't before they got sick. And those barriers mean that this is not discussed with patients as frequently as it should be. A very big survey of uh, US-based oncologists, nine out of ten oncologists recognised that fertility was an important subject to discuss with their patients. But for various reasons, and largely the ones I've already mentioned, Less than half discuss it with all of their patients. 
And it's just worth thinking about whether you, you know, or if you just reflect on whether you'd rather be looked after by an oncologist who thought the fertility was unimportant or thought, thought the fertility was important but didn't choose to discuss it with you. And there will be other difficult to approach topics in whatever line of work you're in where there may be a similar approach. Just think about how you bring up those difficult subjects and do you do it every time? Because it can be hard to do that. For older female patients, technology is largely based on IVF, uh, standard IVF. So older patients can have ovarian stimulation, hyperovulate, collect eggs, and freeze them as eggs or embryos. Success rates from that are good, maybe 10, embryo, uh, 10 eggs per live birth, maybe four embryos per live birth. Works well, but it's only available to patients with a slowly progressive malignancy who are pretty well, because you've got to wait at least 10 days, two weeks to do it. And they really need to be over 16 and, in most centres, sexually active because it involves repeated transvaginal ultrasound. So for paediatric patients, the bulk of the patients I look after, not actually very useful technique. So I got interested in this uh, subject actually quite a long time ago now when I was working with the Teenage Cancer Trust around the five-year sense of tumour confidence. Is anyone here actually involved in paediatric oncology on a regular basis? Yeah, a couple of people. Okay, so five-year sense of tumour is, is a national conference for... 13 plus year olds diagnosed from across the UK, Ireland, and actually there is a group in Australia, Canteen, who often come across to it. Um, they survey patients, they look at what's important, and then when we find those uh, important subjects, we direct talks at that Finding Sense of Tumor conference towards, towards those topics for their uh, education and to help them with their survivorship. Now, fertility kept coming out as important, and we've surveyed patients at seven year intervals. Uh, about their experience of fertility preservation. And what that showed is that female patients are much less likely to have a discussion about fertility than male patients, and they're much more likely to be dissatisfied with that conversation. And that reflects what I've been saying. If you're a teenage boy diagnosed with cancer, told you may be rendered infertile, but we can offer you sperm banking, you're much more likely to be satisfied with that conversation than a female patient who's told you may be rendered infertile and there's nothing we can do about it. And at the time we did that work, back in 2011, and published it in 2013, that pretty much was the state of play. And at that time, I was a fairly newly appointed consultant. We wrote the paper up, I wrote some guidelines for my trust, and I kind of forgot about it. It ended up on one side. And then I saw this in the newspaper about three years later. And this, for me, was the moment where I realized there's something else that we could and probably should be doing. I had to do some reading, get myself up to date, and then I had to be pretty proactive about it. That was in the Guardian newspaper. I googled the consultant who was referencing that paper, and I got in touch with her. And what I discovered was actually there is a program happening in the UK whereby patients can have tissue cryopreservation to help, help give them an option of future fertility. And that resulted in me starting to send patients down to Oxford to have their, their surgery. And ultimately, over the last couple of years, we've started to set that service up locally in Sheffield. And now in Sheffield, we see patients from Sheffield, Leeds, uh, Nottingham and Leicester, and we bring them in, we do their uh, tissue cryopreservation, and then we send the tissue down to Oxford where it is stored, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We're doing our 50th patient next week, okay? So this is not a very, very infrequent thing. We probably see a patient about once a fortnight, once every 10 days. Okay, and we can turn those patients around within three or four days, get the surgery done. If they need a central line, we put it at the same time. If they need a staging investigation or anaesthetic, we do it at the same time. And it's giving those patients an option. So what are we talking about? We're talking about tissue cryopreservation. So instead of freezing eggs, instead of freezing uh, sperm, we're freezing bits of reproductive tissue. So in boys, we're looking at freezing spermatogonial stem cells from a testicular wedge biopsy. And in girls, we're, we're interested in the ovarian cortex, which contains all the immature oocytes that that young lady's ever going to have. Okay? And the great thing about that is they're present from birth. So we can do this in pretty much any age. They store forever. Okay? So once they're in storage, it doesn't matter how old the patient is when they want to use the tissue. And there's no delay in setting it up. They don't need that stimulation. And the patient doesn't need to do anything. They just need to fall asleep when they're given their anesthetic. But we've got to be really careful when we're talking to parents about this because this is not absolutely sorted. Okay? This is a clinical storage program that we're able to offer which sits alongside a research program. 
for male patients, those spermatogonial stem cells are not yet active. That's the whole point. They're not doing anything. They're just sat there in the testicle waiting to be activated at puberty. And we don't yet know how to switch them on in vitro. So we're counselling these families, these patients, about keeping a future fertility option open. We cannot offer this as a solution to their future fertility. They may choose never to want children, in which case they didn't need this procedure done now, but we can't second guess that. It may be that we're able to mature that tissue in vitro and then use it in standard IVF technology. Or it may be that this technology is completely leapfrogged and by the time that patient wants to have a child, we have a better option that doesn't require this stored tissue. So we have to be really careful to focus on the hope, but not the hype. Situation is a bit different in female patients. In female patients, ovarian autotransplantation, that is giving that patient back a little bit of their ovarian cortex, works. Okay, you can insert that tissue under the skin of the forearm, the patient will start to have periods and their bone health will improve. If you autotransplant that tissue back into the abdomen, they will ovulate and they can have a pregnancy. And there have been 50 plus pregnancies reported in the literature worldwide after autotransplantation. And that is what, you know, that we, have, we have put some tissue back in the UK. To be fair, Europe and Israel are well ahead of the game compared to the UK and, and the rest of, uh, yeah, the UK, essentially, uh, and, and are large parts of Europe. If you put that tissue back from a patient with malignant disease, there is a risk of reintroducing malignant, uh, malignancy. And so at the moment, that auto-transplantation option is only available to patients having, um, say, a bone marrow transplant for a non-malignant condition like sickle cell disease or, or thalassemia. But Oxford have started putting tissue back. They've given tissue back to three or four women, and, and their fertility should, in theory, be restored. Um, for, for patients who have malignancy, we need to develop one of two things, either models to, uh, to rule out the presence of malignant tissue within their stored ovarian uh, tissue, and there's put work going on looking at uh, mice models, naked mice, to kind of do that. Um, or we need to develop in vitro maturation. So take those immature oocytes and mature them in the lab, much like the spermatogonial, cell, spermatogonial stem cells that need turning on, so that they can be fertilised in vitro and reimplanted. Okay. We also have to talk about egg donation, sperm donation, and um, adoption as options for having a family. Um, but there is definitely hope. Now, one of the real joys and challenges about paediatrics is making a connection and, and getting on the wavelength of those young people. Uh, who, whose waiting room sometimes looks a bit like that? Or whose consultation room sometimes looks a bit like that? Sometimes it's really hard to make that connection, isn't it, with the child? And it's crucially important if you're talking about future fertility, about tissue cryopreservation. Um, I mean, a very simple thing is just to always introduce yourself to the child. So when the child comes into the room, introduce yourself to them. And if they're old enough, ask who they've brought with them. That puts them at the centre of the consultation straight away. Yeah, it means they realise that you're interested in what they might have to say. But the other thing is to understand the language they speak. You know, an eight-year-old boy is not going to have a clue what a testicular wedge biopsy is. You know? So they may not even know what their testicles are. My, my, my little boy's now... 12. He hates me telling this anecdote. But when, when he was four or five, he would very happily eat um, popcorn chicken chi or chicken goujons, but he would not touch a chicken nugget. And I, I could not understand this at all. Um, and eventually I worked out it's because him and all his little mates in his class at school called their testicles their chicken nuggets. And he, he actually thought that McDonald's were trying to serve him little boy's testicles in his Happy Meal. Yeah? But the only way you'll find that out is if you ask. Yeah? So you need to find out. Ask the parents, ask the kid, what do you call your testicles? Are they your balls? Are they your chicken nuggets? Are they something else? And you hear all kinds of things. Um, and when you know what they, they, what, you know what they know what they are, you can start to talk about an operation where we take a little piece of it. Imagine it's a chocolate orange. We're taking out a segment. We're going to freeze that. And in the future, we may use that for you to help you have a child. Yeah? It's really important to get on their level. The other thing I thought I'd talk about a little bit, given that the NHS has got absolutely no money, I'm talking about developing a new service that is not yet being commissioned nationally, is how the hell can you do that? Yeah? This could pretty much have been my business case when I, took, when I went to speak to managers. I want to make things better for our patients. 
And it can be done, even in the NHS with no money, uh, if you can demonstrate that you are going to make a measurable improvement to patients' options without actually costing anything. Yeah? So if it doesn't cost any money, you can probably do it. And the way to make sure it doesn't cost any money is to make sure that your trusts don't see that it costs any money. Okay? So there are bits of this they need to know about, and that's the bits that actually happen with the patient in a measurable way. So th these patients have to, obviously have to have an operation. We've agreed that we'll just bill for a laparoscopic oophorectomy, we'll bill for a testicular wedge biopsy, as if they're not having tissue cryopreservation. The storage and processing is picked up by a charity in Oxford, so Sheffield aren't bothered about that. And as long as we've got a complete buy-in from the clinical team who are involved, we can do this, and we do it very successfully. But that has meant that my surgical colleagues have had to commit to prioritizing these cases at very short notice. So them and they and their uh, administrative staff are forever canceling patients and rearranging them to fit them in. They still have to get done within their 18-week RTT, otherwise the trust loses money and then they'll get cross with me. But it can be done, providing you're prepared to put in the time and the effort. And it put, it's an enormous kind of amount of time and energy of your own you have to put in. But it can be done. Find the manager. Find the manager that's interested in quality. Get them to help you approach the bean counters. Yeah? And keep the bean counters out of it to the last minute. But you can, you really can develop services for patients if you really focus on the quality. If you can hold out the possible prospect of future national commissioning, that helps too. But whether that will happen, and even if we'll get selected as a site when it does, I don't know. But until then, I want to be able to offer this service for patients that come under my care and in the little little sphere around uh, Sheffield that where we can offer it. And ultimately, everything I've talked about is really about making sure that patients are, equi patients are equipped to make informed choices about their care. And I think that's what we all have to be aiming for. Where, whatever your role, whatever your specialty, whatever your seniority, patients need information to make good choices. And we have to be proactive about that. We have to be, make sure we're up to date and that we know what we're talking about. And we have to make sure those discussions are open and honest in and in language that the patients can understand. And if we do that, we're going to give our patients a really, really good service. And actually, for many of you probably will never refer a patient for ovarian or testicular cryopreservation. So thanks for putting up with me for 15 minutes. And, but that last bit may be the most important take-home message. Okay? Thanks very much. <laughs>